very low to the ground, I feel like. I, I find it very hard to see. So I can make sure that one that has a Good afternoon. I am the chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, Councilmember Cabrera. I'm joined by Councilmembers Yeager, Kalos, and Powers. Today we're having a first hearing on Intro 747, sponsored by myself, in relation to prohibiting the distribution of public matching funds to candidates previously convicted of certain felonies. Introduction 773. Uh, sponsored by Councilmember Powers in relation to amending the definition of business dealings with the city to include certain uncertified applications to the Department of City Planning and Intro 774, also sponsored by Councilmember Powers in relation to the per contributor amount of public funding threshold for eligibility. Since 1998, New York City's Campaign Finance Act, as administered by the Campaign Finance Board, has provided candidates who's, who, who's, who choose to participate in the city's public financing program with matching funds to help finance their campaigns. The intent of the public financing program is to prevent corruption to enhance public confidence in the local government by reducing improper influence of big dollar campaign contributors and to increase engagement with local communities by encouraging candidates to raise small dollar contributions from av average New Yorkers. Regarding Introduction 747, while the Campaign Finance Act and the CFP rules enumerate various reasons from which CFP may determine a candidate is ineligible to participate in the public financing program, neither prevents candidates convicted of general crimes relating to public corruption or fraud from receiving public matching funds if otherwise eligible. Rather, CFB rules provide that if a participant has committed fraud in the course of program participation or if the CFB believes a participant engaged in conduct detrimental to the program that is in violation of any other applicable law, then CFB can withhold public funds from a participating candidate. Intro 747 will prohibit the distribution of public matching funds to candidates who have been convicted of certain felonies relating to public corruption and fraud. This will apply to candidates convicted of felony offenses related to bribery involving public servants, corrupting the government, grand larceny in connection to theft, public funds, first degree offenses for falsifying business record, tampering, tampering with public records, or offering a false instrument if in connection to public funds, defrauding the government, theft, or bribery concerning programs receiving federal funds, federal fraud offenses, or, felon or any felony attempt or conspiracy to commit any of these crimes. Candidates will not be denied public matching funds if their convictions were vacated or pardoned by the governor where relevant. Regarding Intro 773 by Powers, the, counts, uh, the Campaign Finance Act places limits on contribution a participating candidate may accept from a person who has business dealing with the city as defined by the act. It further, further provides that such contributions are not eligible to be matched with public funds. Business dealings with the city include applications for approval under the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure, as well as applications for zoning tax amendment. But only once the City Planning Commission has certified an application is complete. Into certification, the land use participant, uh, applicants may make maximum contributions to candidates and candidates may receive public matching funds for such contribution. Intro 773 will amend the definition of business dealing with the city to include person who has filed application on the ULORP and application for zoning tax amendments, regardless of whether the application has been certified. Excuse me. Finally, regarding introduction 774 by powers under the Campaign Finance Act, Contributions under $10, while matchable, do not count towards the qualifying threshold for uh, 
do not count towards the qualifying threshold for matching funds. Concerns have been raised that this minimum contribution of $10 can impose a financial burden on, on New Yorkers from economically disadvantaged areas of the city and functionally exclude most of vulnerable New Yorkers from the process. As a result, candidates can struggle to raise the number of matchable contributions from district residents necessary to qualify for public funds. Under intro 774, candidates must still meet the total contribution threshold applicable to the office they seek, as well as the required number of contributors. However, instead of contributions of at least $10 counting towards the qualifying threshold, the bill would allow contribution as low as $5 to count towards the qualifying threshold for public matching funds. The bill would apply to candidates for every cover up. I would like to thank our staff whose work made this hearing possible, Daniel Collins, Elizabeth Cronk, uh, Emily Forjom, Sebastian Bacci, and Charlotte Martin, as well as my own legislative director, Claire McLevain, and I ask my colleagues, Council Member Powers, to speak on his legislation. Thank you, and good afternoon. Um, thank you to the Chair for hearing these bills and also for your comments. I have two bills before this, this uh, committee today. The first is a simple, but I think an effective bill that lowers the contribution, qualifying a con 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 uh, contribution from $10 from what it is today to $5. So for many of us, when we were running for office in order to qualify for matching funds, we had for council, we had to go ahead and receive 75 industry contributions of $10 or more. And for me and, and others, we had to go out and, and, and do that and, and talk to our neighbors and talk to folks in our district. And um, to me, it's, a, it's an actually a perfectly reasonable threshold. You have to go out, a number, you have to go out and show support. But I think for many candidates I heard, just a simple question of why it was $10, not $5. And I think it, as we approach 2021, we have a large scale elections in the city for many seats and city council seats as well. Uh, it would be an easier way just to encourage people to get into the matching funds program and make it easier and ease that burden for people in terms of getting into the program. And I'll note, well, I think $1 is matchable, but this would be about how already, but uh, this would be getting you into the program uh, easier <coughs> and more effectively. The second one is a um, is a bill that would start the doing business limitations for contributions earlier in the process, which is predominantly, as I see it, for land use applications. Today, when somebody has a land use application, they go into the doing business database at the point where they certify the application by city planning, rather than in, a, in an earlier period of time. And I know in my district and throughout many other districts, these projects start early, so occasionally they start years before with the conversations around that particular application and it seems to me if we're gonna have a system by which we limit contributions for those who are doing business, we should do it at the point where that those business dealings begin rather than um, uh, sort of somewhere when they begin the actual EULER time, timeline and clock. And it, this is actually a recommendation that came to me through a, an individual um, some, some period back and I thought it was a sensible and reasonable one to give uh, more assurances to people that um, the doing business database reflects those who are doing business. So, um, uh, I, and I just want to note, and I will hear from them momentarily, the $10 to $5, I believe, is also a recommendation from the Campaign Finance Board in one of their reports. So I thank them for that recommendation as well. And with that being said, I look forward to hearing comments on both bills, and I want to thank the Chair for giving me the opportunity to hear these bills today. Well, Thanks. thank you so much, Councilmember Powers, and thank you for championing um, these two bills. You know, uh, my district, uh, and I have the list here, we're literally the fourth, uh, in terms of giving, uh, we had the average amount of contribution, we had the four lowest, and I could tell you, in a community like mine, uh, this is going to be helpful for people uh, running for city office. So I really appreciate uh, uh, leading uh, the way. And with that, let me turn it over to the council to sorry in the administration. If you could both raise your hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. If you could introduce yourselves before starting. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and members of the Committee on Government and Operations. My name is Amy Loprest. I am the Executive Director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. With me today is Eric Friedman, who is the Campaign Finance Board's Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs. 
Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today on intros 4, 747, sponsored by Chair Fernando Cabrera, and intros number 773 and 774, sponsored by Council Member Keith Bowers. The CFP is supportive of all three measures before the committee today. Each bill is based on a board proposal included among the legislative recommendations in our 2017 post-election report, and we are pleased to be discussing them here today. Each of the three bills would make simple but important changes to the Campaign Finance Act that will enhance the matching funds program by further increasing the role of small contributors and further reducing the risk or appearance of corruption. Interest number 747 would prohibit the distribution of matching funds to candidates convicted of felonies related to public corruption. As you may recall, one participating candidate for city council in 2017 had previously served 21 months in prison for mail fraud and conspiracy for steering council discretionary funds to a nonprofit that were ultimately used to pay staff members for campaign work. However, he met the threshold to qualify and receive public funds for his 2017 campaign. Ensuring that individuals with a track record of fraud do not receive public funds is not only good public policy, but is fundamental to the integrity of the matching funds program. Connecticut's citizen election program has a similar, similar policy in which candidates who have been previously convicted of a felony related to that individual's holding of public office are disqualified from receiving public money. We recommend that where intro number 4, 747 references sections of the penal code that are fairly broad, such as wire fraud, language should be added to explicitly tie these crimes to an individual's actions as an elected official or candidate. Additionally, we think that this legislation should also apply to people who criminally violate election law. The council may also want to consider extending intro number 747 to cover misdemeanors related to corruption, particularly in connection with government funds, as candidates tend to plead to misdemeanors to avoid a felony conviction. For example, a 2013 candidate who was recently indicted on seven felony counts related to engaging in a straw donor scheme admitted to the scheme and pled to a single misdemeanor charge. The Council should consider extending Intro 747 to cover misdemeanors that are specifically related to corruption and the misuse of government funds. This is an important and necessary step for maintaining public trust in the matching funds program. Additionally, we urge the Council to consider including a time limit so that people are not permanently barred from receiving public funds once they have served their sentences and reformed. For example, the Council might consider having this apply for five years to misdemeanors and 10 years for felony convictions. Intro number 773 would amend the definition of business dealings with the city to include uncertified land use applications, which expand the coverage of the doing business database. Currently, the New York City Campaign Finance Act limits contributions from anyone seeking land use approvals once the city planning commission has certified their application. But this does not include those who have declared their intent to seek an approval by filing an application which may be months or even years before certification. An applicant could therefore give a maximum contribution after the application is filed but before it is certified. The timing of such contributions suggests that they may have been made with the intent to influence the decisions. Intro 773 is an effective way to ensure that matching funds program is doing everything it can to curb both the corruption and the appearance of corruption. This bill would also ensure that the doing business restrictions more effectively fulfill their intent. In this spirit, there are further changes to the Act's doing business provisions that the Council may want to consider. Some of the land use proposals from the 2019 Charter Vision Commission could require the Council to alter the bill. It is our understanding that this bill's aim is to move the doing business start date to the earliest formal date for a particular project at the start of the uniform land use review procedures. However, the potential charter amendment would create a new formal first step in that process, the filing of a project information form. The Council should also take into consideration and amend the bill language to include the project information form before moving the legislation forward. Additionally, current legislation keeps those on the doing business database for a ULERP action on the database for 120 days after the Council has completed its disposition of the matter. All other doing business actions require people to remain on the database for one year after the end of the transaction. We suggest the Council consider whether the ULIP coverage period should be similarly extended to one year. 
The CFP is happy to work with the council and relevant staff on other ways to enhance the doing business database process. Finally, intro 774 would lower the minimum contribution counted towards meeting the threshold for public funds from $10 to $5. Currently, all contributions, even those as low as $1, are eligible for match, but contributions under $10 do not count towards meeting the threshold to receive public funds. We have heard from candidates in wealthy well districts that $10 is a tough ask for many of their supporters. Lowering the amount to $5 would allow more residents to participate in helping their favorite candidates qualify for matching funds, and more candidates would be able to meet the threshold sooner in the election year. Lowering the minimum contribution to $5 is a simple and effective way to engage more New Yorkers in our democratic process. We are happy to see our legislative recommendations re reflected in the legislation being heard today. These bills will further enhance the matching funds program and amplify the voices of everyday New Yorkers. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, and I appreciate, um, I'm sure Councilmember Powers is gonna address these bills, but your recommendation to make uh, 747, uh, intro 747 stronger, a better bill, and I, I love your suggestion, so we'll definitely uh, implement them. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, uh, Councilmember Powers. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, you had uh, just a couple questions on the bills, and I appreciate the testimony and the support for them and the recommendations for some uh, additions or amendments to them. Um, the first one I want to ask is just the, um, your recommendation in, I think, one of your post-campaign reports was to do the, or, the, or make the change from 10 to five. Is there a reason you wouldn't go down to $1, for instance? Um, I, it, 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 five is a round number, maybe that's why one chose it, but you know, I think, and I, I, I noted in testimony after this, there was a recommendation to even go down to three or one dollar, just to, you know, just to say basically, if you're gonna go down, you might as well, you might as well lower it down to the matching, the, the same as the matching number. Um, I guess one of the reasons for the threshold to begin with is to demonstrate that candidates have support in their community and so when we were making that recommendation, we thought, you know, it's to make sure that it's a serious showing of support in their community, that $5 made more sense. You know, obviously we want to, you know, listen to the concerns that we've heard that $10 is a big ask. $5 seemed, you know, a balance between showing that there's a serious support for that candidate and the, you know, burdens of, uh, the financial burdens of people in certain districts. Got it, and have you done any sort of look at, um in past co elections in terms of how many contributions were at the $10 level versus the $5 level versus the $1 level in terms of, um, I, you know, pres presumably to me there's that, that point, which is that there's a difficulty. So some people might do the 10, but obviously five would be easier for them. But has, it, has there, do you guys done any sort of number crunching on impact? I mean, we've done some number crunching, but I'm gonna let Eric, you know, we can get you more information about it. Um, I think that, uh, again, there aren't that many $1 contributions, but right. I think, you know, part of it is the, sometimes the law drives the ask. So, right. you know, it's hard to predict what will happen when you change what the ask is. Because because the the law requires the ten dollar ask candidates are asking for ten dollars and so there will be fewer contributions for five dollars than there would normally be if we lower the threshold so I mean I, I, we're happy to follow up with more numbers um, I don't know that they would provide <coughs> a lot of meaningful information to right. one way or the other uh, about this bill okay um, and the um, and, and and for me I just want to make a statement that on um, for me like the the process of meeting my qualifying thresholds was important both from the certainty of knowing that or the some some higher level of certainty of knowing that but also as I was talking to uh, folks to be able to say that I had met that and I think that if you have some contributions at the five dollar level maybe even lower that could qualify but don't today um, that that would give some certainty to some folks about getting into the program early, and that was part of the intention. Um, I wanted to move to the question or the uh, uh, comments related to the bill, the bill on the doing business um, database, and you mentioned the charter consideration of a project information form. I'm, I 
probably should be more familiar with what that is, but can you give us some information on what that is that they're looking at and when in the, when in the process of um, your you know, consideration of your application that you would have to file that form? I mean, again, I'm like, I'm, I'm also not like, you know, the, 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 the proposals are not completely fleshed out for the Charter Revision Commission because they haven't issued their final report. Mm. Um, they, of course, are, I mean, one of the goals of, the, of that stated goals of the commission is to uh, formalize the process and revamp the process and allow more input from the community earlier in the process that people are talking about making changes to, you know, zoning law and um, particular individual projects. So this would be a form that would be completed earlier in the process as people are thinking about, even earlier than you file the ULERP application. Um, exactly the parameters of that, I am not 100% familiar, but again, the I, since the goal I, in, of our recommendation and I think of your proposed legislation is to include people earlier, as early as possible in the doing business database to avoid the perception or actual you know, influence seeking of giving large contributions uh, that the doing business database seeks to avoid. It would be important to move that to the earliest possible date that you someone declares their interest in a land use uh, process. Got it. And are there other, um, and as we're talking about the doing business database and ways to, you know, make sure that the intention of the law, I guess, reflects the reality of the practice and the law, are there other areas where you feel that if we're looking at this particular situation, which is the one that I was most aware of, are there other areas of where one has to enter into the doing business database where we should be looking at starting that at a different t time point. Could be whether you're bidding on a city contract or you're registered as a lobbyist or some other method or means for by which you have to go into the database. Are there other recommendations about when we should s maybe start time points earlier? Well, we're happy to talk to you and the staff about more, but. This is the primary recommendation because most of the other processes, like in the contracting process, it starts, you know, when you declare, like when you're uh, responding to a request for a proposal, you're declaring your intention to be part of the contracting process. So it, it's, you know, that is pretty much the earliest process that someone is declaring their intention. So uh, there's not a lot of other places where earlier is not covered. I got it. So one, yeah. one other one other just piece of information I would add to, to what Amy said. So people in the database for land use actions represent really only about 1% of the names uh, in the database overall. Um, I mean, so to the extent that, again, this bill seeks to um, more accurately capture the universe of people who may have interest in a particular land use decision uh, and ensure that the law covers their um, political giving. Uh, I mean, that's a good thing. That's a, that's a good place to look. Um, you know, if there is a place where, where activity is kind of underrepresented, uh, then, then I think, again, land use is... And, and you know the 1% of the doing business database is reflected, is, is based on land use applications, that's the number you used. But I, my assumption without having done this in any, is that the, the amount, like some, a lot of people who are doing business with the city via city contract may not be contributing to candidates in the same way where somebody who has a very discretionary action uh, before the count before the council before the you know, our president before the mayor's office may do that have you done any any analysis of larger picture of the actual contribution like what what part of the pie the contributions ta take shape form of relative to doing business database like my assumption being that even though it's a small amount of the doing business data about it's a larger share of money that's being donated by any group of people in the doing business database I, I mean, so, so in, in the post-election, or 2017 post-election report, we did an analysis of people in the doing business database and their percentage of contributions. Um, we didn't look at it a granular way of, uh, you know, which, but I think we definitely have that, I think we have the capacity to do that, so we can look into that more. I mean, again, sure. it is a pretty small number, and the, once you're in the database, your contribution numbers are pretty low. Um, so it's, you know, as part of the, not far as total contributions, it is a fairly low amount. And again, as Eric said, uh, it's only 1% of the people that are in the doing business database are in there because of 
they're doing land use transactions. Got it. And have you had any conversations with the mayor's office or contract services or city planning about this legislation and their feedback on it? And also, any have they given you any um, understanding of how many how many uh, text amendments or ULERPs would now be included that are not currently included? So, okay, so there, uh, so we have had conversations with the Mayor's Office and Contract Services about this, and so they are on board with the, uh, the concept. There aren't a large number of uh, people that are in, in city planning that have, uh, there are, so there are 87 ULERP applications in the Department of City Planning that have that for zoning actions that ha, and zoning actions that have been applied for but not certified. So it's only 87. Of course, it's it's unclear, you know, from that 87 applications how many individual people that would be. It's at least 87, but it, so it's not a huge number. But again, it's important to you know, ref, have this database reflect. You know, we have one of the most comprehensive doing business uh, laws in the country, and so to really make sure that it covers as fully as possible everyone involved who are seeking influence over the government. And, and just for just for purposes of comparison, so there are 403 people in the database because of land use relationships. So just to give a sense of the okay. magnitude um, that you'd be adding with that 87. Yes. Okay, good, thank you, appreciate that. And do you anticipate any behavior that one could use to avoid inclusion if you, one so desired, if we pass this law, meaning holding off on submitting an application, or is there a, is there a, net, is there a process that's discretionary in terms of when you go to city planning that might, one might hold, if, if somebody decided to be nefarious in the way they approach this, is there any, any way that they, could avoid, or, or have you had any conversations with city planning about one what, ways one might avoid having to go into this? Um, I mean, there, again, there may be. I think that, I mean, unlike a contracting where, you know, a city agency controls the timing of releasing of a contract and uh, of an RFP, and, um, you know, certain land use decisions are, have the people asking for the government's interaction have more control over the timing of that than in certain other kinds of doing business actions. So um, there, there may be some room, and I don't know how you would completely uh, control for that. Okay. Well, if, if we can, we could talk after the hearing, but, you know, one thing we want to make sure is that it covers the scenarios that we're intending to cover. And I just, this is a question I know the answer to, everybody wants to be, have it on the record. This would not apply to anybody who has an as-of-right project in New York City with no discretionary action. That's is that correct? correct. And um, final question, have you done any calculated how many contributions in the 2017 election cycle this would have impact? I know we have the numbers of who, how many are in today, the day doing business database, there's 80 and 403, I think was the number, and 87 ULARPs that are uncertified before city planning. Have we looked, have you done any analysis of the 2017 election to look at how many uncovered contributions, how many contributions would become covered by that? That's not a number we have. We're happy to, to look into performing that analysis yeah. and, and sharing the numbers with you. It may be difficult to do that, so just to, <laughs> to, to uh, measure expectation because, again, those applications, you know, it's like it's at any particular point in time, so, you know, you'd have to calculate at ev everybody's contribution at any particular time. So, we, I mean, it, I think it is doable, but it's not, a, you know, a red, like the $5 and $1 analysis is readily yeah, yeah, easy done. I see. Okay, thank you for the answering the questions and for the data as well. Helpful to understand the impact and the scope for today. And thank you again to the chair for uh, giving me time to ask questions. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. I, I just have a few uh, questions uh, just for the record. I know you mentioned in your analysis of the 2017 election cycle, you noted one uh, participating candidate who served uh, prison time for fraud. Are you aware of any other candidates uh, in the 2017 or prior to that? Who have received public funds after being uh, convicted of fraud? Um, there definitely was that one candidate. I mean, there are, um, there are other candidates who have been accused of fraud. I'm trying to think if there's a, I, I, to my recollection, whether there's a person who's actually been convicted and then received, I don't. I don't know of any other specific example of that. Okay. 
Uh, will you amend the list of offenses included in, the, in intro 747 to include more offenses or exclude some of the offenses? Uh, do you have a list of particular misdemeanors relating to corruption? Uh, you, you expanded, uh, you had uh, expand this bill to include? You know, is it just misdemeanor versions of the bill's existing list or do you have any other misdemeanor crimes in mind? Um, so in addition to the, uh, the, the violations of, uh, criminal violations of election law, some of which are misdemeanors, um, they are the, uh, what we would recommend are the misdemeanors associated with the list that are already in the law. So there's, you know, some, there's certain sections enumerated and the ones that are skipped over are, they're, they're in, I think, section of 200 of the criminal code. And, I will get back to you and make sure that I'm not misstating it, but there are some misdemeanors listed, uh, crimes listed in that section 200 that are, wouldn't be covered now, but we recommend it be covered. I understand, uh, thank you. Uh, I understand that you're recommending adding a sunset provision uh, to the bill that will allow people with convictions to again qualify for program participation five or 10 years later. Why, if at all, uh, might such sunset date be appropriate or necessary? And uh, to be clear, are you proposing this to be five or 10 years following release from prison or parole, probation? Uh, or will you count years in prison towards that sunset date? So um, we're happy to, so for the latter question, we're happy to discuss that more with you. We have, um, we're in the process of kind of looking at what is public available, you know, so that you, obviously, you know, some information about people's uh, convictions and uh, term of service uh, crime served are readily publicly available and some are not. And so we're, you know, before making a recommendation of where that sunset position should exactly run from, we're doing some more research into what is publicly available because we don't want to be intrusive into people, you know, asking every candidate about this or things like that. We would want to make sure that the information is publicly available. Um, and the reason, you know, to have a sunset position provision is because, you know, the trend uh, in election law and, you know, in our recommendations in many other cases is that people who are convicted of crime, you know, have done their time and so they shouldn't be permanently barred from participating in this program. Uh, the five years seemed reasonable for people who convicted of a misdemeanor and 10 years convicted of a felony. But again, we're happy to discuss with you more about, you know, when that time should run from and uh, the specifics of how many years that should run. Thank you. Um, you recommended limiting certain offenses delineated in the bill to be limited to cases where the candidate's action related to public office or election. The bill already does this with regards to felony grand larceny and falsifying business record, tampering with public record, or offering, offering a false instrument. Do you have any concerns with limiting language and will requiring CFB and to investigate the underlying factual basis for any conviction be administratively burdensome for CFB? Um, so I, it, it's more, um, that comment is more related to the federal crimes of wire and mail fraud in general, because there are you know, many, many different kinds of things, you know, you could, uh, someone could be convicted of that. And so what we were suggesting, and we can again work, our staff can work with your staff on language of, you know, how to describe the, because uh, we would, you, I know the intent of the law is to cover crimes that are related to the misuse of government funds. And so uh, making sure that those broader wire fraud and mail fraud offenses are tied to that uh, is an important limiting factor. Again, of course, as I just said about the time served, you know, we would want to make sure that it's not, it's clear and that it would be not administratively burdensome, that we, we wouldn't be judging people's various convictions. We, it would be a clear standard of which things were covered and which things weren't. But we are happy to work with you more on that. All right, let me uh, just mention the last uh, piece here of my line of question, but let me just recognize we've been joined by council member myself. And that is your, your post uh, 2017 election cycle reports 
uh, report cites Connecticut's clean election program, which since 2012 has prevented public grants to candidates who have been convicted of a felony, felony related to the individual's public office. Are you aware of any hurdles Connecticut has faced in implementing this provision that we should take into account should we pass intro 747 into law? Has Connecticut, has the Connecticut program been successful in preventing public funds from going to candidates convicted of such felony? And I'll come back with two more questions related to that. I don't wanna <laughs> overload you. So I'll give you the, the legal answer and Eric who worked in uh, as a reporter uh, covering politics in Connecticut is itching to tell you some of the stories about uh, <laughs> how successful this has been, but uh, so I'll turn it over to him. But a, a, there was a, a constitutional challenge to the law and uh, the law was upheld by the federal court in Connecticut. So there's no constitutional bar to uh, imp uh, imposing a restriction like this, primarily based on the idea that it doesn't limit your free speech to exclude you from receiving additional pu you know, public benefit. Um, th that's exactly right. I, I, I'm not sure that there, there are kind of broad lessons to take away from the application of, of this bar in Connecticut, but you know, that's because hopefully, and I think actually, you know, cases of corruption among public officials are pretty rare, right? And it shouldn't, it shouldn't apply generally to a lot of people. The, the largest kind of high profile example that Amy mentioned was uh, a case involving uh, the former and current mayor of Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, who in 2003 was convicted um, f in a, for a series of offenses related to a um, kind of kickback scheme he had uh, kind of going with some city contractors who would funnel kind of six-figure payoffs through a PR firm that was associated with him. Um, and it was a very, very high profile case and generated a lot of interest and coverage around Connecticut. Um, after he served his term, um, he came back and, and ran, for, ran successfully for mayor of Bridgeport. Um, he sought the Democratic nomination for governor in Connecticut um, for 2018 and was barred um, by the state's clean elections program from participating. Um, so as, as Amy mentioned, he challenged that law in federal court and the law was upheld um, because, you know, it, Declining to subsidize a candidate's free speech is not the same thing as, as depriving him of free speech. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, there is a, um, a significant and substantial um, legitimate government interest in preventing corruption and the appearance of corruption, as well as protecting the public fisc and, and um, maintaining confidence in the way those funds are being used. And so all of those interests apply to our program here in New York City. So that's. That is why we made the proposal we did and why we support the legislation in any way. You actually answer the next question I was <laughs> gonna <laughs> ask, but uh, I wanna go back to my first question. Did, did it have any hurdles in implementing the law in Connecticut that you know of? Well, I think actually because the, the law was passed after um, someone was convicted of bribery and then ran and received $80,000 in public funds and there was such a public uproar, oh, this person was convicted in 2005 of bribery and now he just received $80,000 in public funds that there was, you know, a kind of public upcry, outcry about, you know, using the public fund, funding program for that and so, uh, that, and so it didn't have money hurdles getting passed and that, again, the constitutional hurdle was also overcome. And I, I would just actually add but one. But the in implementation piece, there was other than the court case implementing the whole process, there was no problems, right? No hurdles, no, no challenges. No. Okay. And you don't know any other jurisdiction, municipality that have implemented such a law where they have been challenged? I mean, there aren't that many significant public financing, we can look into it. I mean, whether Los Angeles has a similar provision, um, it's again, you know, one of the more longstanding public financing programs, or whether Arizona does, so we can look into that. Um, but I, I think that uh, it, it's a common sense, I think, you know, to avoid the uh, corruption or the appearance of corruption. Well, it's my hope that once we pass it, God willing, uh, that other municipalities will follow suit and uh, follow our lead 
Uh, and and as Eric said, of course, this, the convictions for public corruption are very, very, very rare, so it's not like there's you know, a huge experience for in, in implementing this. Indeed. Uh, any questions from my colleagues? Any questions? No? Oh, Eric, you were going to say something? Oh, I, I'm I, so had, sorry. I, I was just going to add one detail to, to um, the story that Amy explained about the, the, the genesis of the law in Connecticut. So the, the state representative who, who was convicted in 2005 uh, for, for accepting a bribe came back and ran for, re ran for re election in the Clean Elections Program in 2012. He actually was uh, convicted of qualifying for the program fraudulently in that 2012 race. Yes, it so was, that, <laughs> it was. It was after, it was yes, after that. Yes, that, yes, that, um, that, <laughs> that extra detail pushed it right along. Right, right, right. That like, was, yes, made, yes. made yes. Um, really helped make the case for the, this law uh, in Connecticut. So. Well, I, I know I, I could speak on behalf of the committee. We want to thank you. Thank you for the suggestions. Thank you for being a catalyst uh, in bringing integrity uh, into uh, uh, a process that sometimes uh, there could be loopholes that people could try to take advantage of. And that's what we're here. We're here to make sure that things are done co correctly. And with that, thank you so much. And we'll move to the one other panel that we have. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. Uh, from Van Albany, Alex Camarda. Good to have you, Alex. Again. You can begin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Cabrera, members of the City Council Committee on Governmental Operations. My name is Alex Camarda. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for Reinvent Albany. <coughs> Reinvent Albany advocates for accountable and transparent New York State government. We're also part of the leadership of the Fair Elections Campaign, seeking to establish a public matching system in New York State, which is inspired by uh, the model here in New York City. The three bills before you today, uh, we support uh, all of them. And uh, rather than read all my testimony, I think I'll just summarize uh, briefly for each bill why we support the legislation. So for the, uh, the first bill, Intro 747, which as described previously, um, prohibits the distribution of public matching funds to candidates previously convicted of certain felonies. Uh, the major reason we support this legislation is, is as was said, we don't believe that um, government and taxpayers should be subsidizing candidates who were previously convicted of crimes, serious crimes, related to the public trust. We think that they have the right to run for office again if they've redeemed themselves and, and paid their public debt, but at the same time, we don't believe the taxpayers should fund that. Um, and so that's, me, that's our, our um, reason for supporting that legislation. I do think it's worth noting that, um, as the CFB mentioned, this does cover uh, quite a bit of laws uh, related to the public trust. Uh, they're not um, exactly clear in the bill because they reference different sections of federal and state and local law. I could read some of them just for the record. Um, they involve corrupting the government violations of the New York State penal law, um, grand larceny or larceny related to public funds, falsifying business records, tampering with public records, offering a false instrument for filing, uh, defrauding the government, theft or bribery concerning programs receiving federal funds, uh, engaging in frauds or swindles, committing fraud by wire, radio or television, or honest services fraud. So uh, it is a wide swath of laws. I think we're certainly open to some of the recommendations that CFB uh, just made regarding including criminal violations of election law. Uh, I think that would be obviously relevant to um, receiving public funds for campaigns. On the uh, second bill, intro 774, which lowers to $5 the smallest contribution eligible for the public match, we again support 
uh, that legislation. Um, and, the, and the main reason for that is we want to incentivize and encourage candidates to raise money from small contributions. And from what uh, research we did regarding fundraising, it seems that uh, campaigns actually more and more are focusing on these very small contributions as a way to invite donors, small donors, into the process, regular, everyday New Yorkers. And they find that if they get a small contribution initially, they can grow uh, the contributions by that donor over time. So we think it makes sense to lower the amount from 10 to $5. We would actually recommend even going further to $3, as uh, Councilmember Powers alluded to. Um, the research we've seen shows that actually candidates, and I think many of you have probably received these emails, I know I have from many candidates, um, they actually send out communications that often start with donate $3 rather than 5 and there's, there's good reason for it. They find that that's the optimal amount to at, make an ask for of small donors. So I think if you look at some of the research on that, you might find that three is, is more optimal than five. We did look at the uh, number of donations that were made um, by council members who were elected. We only looked at a, small, a smaller group than actually those who were running for office. And we found that there were 186 donations that were $10 or less, which is a very small percentage, it's 0.72 percent of the donations that went to council members currently serving. Uh, an additional 30 were below $5. And uh, so we think uh, it's worth going lower than 5 to maximize the impact of, of engaging small donors. And then lastly, on intro 773, which would extend the definition of business dealings with the city to include uh, certain uncertified applications to the Department of City Planning. Uh, we support this legislation as well. Um, we th I know Councilmember Powers spoke of this when he first ran for office, and I think it's very important in identifying this kind of engagement that occurs of the city, which we think should be qualified as doing business and hasn't been previously. Uh, a lot of important conversations and meetings could occur when developers uh, and other stakeholders are submitting an application to city planning, yet it's not yet certified. Uh, some of the more important discussions might occur about, around the environmental impact statement, which is something that's, that can be contentious and is always uh, an issue with many projects. And so for, for that reason, uh, we believe that it should be the start point for the lower contributions for doing business should begin with the submission of the application. I would also note that sometimes these applications are um, held by city planning or considered by city planning for at least six months. We've even heard of accounts uh, going as long as years. Uh, and that's a, f a substantial amount of time. I will say that previously reInvent Albany has um, advocated for expanding the doing business database in other ways. I know that was raised uh, during the previous testimony. Two of the big gaps that we see in coverage of the doing business database is clients of lobbyists. Uh, are, they're not included in the doing business database. That came up more recently with the mayor's presidential fundraising for his federal PAC. And also subcontractors. You can have contractors who are subcontractors who do tens of millions of dollars of work with the city, and they won't be in the doing business database. Meanwhile, a very small prime contractor will be. And the same is true of lobbyists and clients. There are clients who don't lobby the city directly. They hire a firm. They may pay ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month. And then you have very small nonprofits who are actually lobbyists, and they're their own clients who are in the doing, beta, be, uh, doing business database, but you have these very large clients who are not. So we think that that's an inequity at, at the very least and, and should be addressed. Um, and with that, I'll close. I welcome any questions you may have. Just have one question related to uh, your uh, sentiments regarding uh, CFB's uh, suggestion to have a sunset for five years uh, for Bill 747 for five years for misdemeanor, 10 years uh, for felonies. Any thoughts? So we didn't officially take a position on that. We're certainly open to considering that. Um, you know, offhand, I think the, 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 time, the time frame ought to be 
perhaps longer for felonies. Um, I mean, I, I think what the CFBI recommended was five years for misdemeanors, 10 years for felonies. Maybe it ought to be a bit longer than that if we're going to have a sunset. You know, I mean, this is a balance between allowing people, candidates to rehabil rehabilitate themselves, pay their debt to society, and, and run for office and let the voters decide, and then also upholding the integrity of the system, particularly when you're using taxpayer dollars. That's always the challenge. Redemption yes. versus trust. Right. You know, it takes time uh, for people uh, to gain that trust, and so it's hard to uh, gauge, but we, we welcome definitely uh, your suggestions. Uh, any questions? And I think with that, we appreciate our, uh, your input. Uh, we got your testimony that I know is more thorough, and uh, we'll, we'll definitely uh, take it into strong consideration. Thank, thank you, you so again. much. And with that, I'd like to thank the staff. As always, you guys do a fantastic job. And with that, we close today's hearing. Thank you. All right, that was quick. Yeah. I, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> We're under an hour. That's the record.